Alright, the next program you can see well, it's different. Uh, Stephen told me, uh, told me uh, that he prefers the interview process. So, uh, I'd like to Brian Lamb. Uh, I, anybody who likes Brian Lamb on book TV once in a while? Uh, I never miss it Sunday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, what a wonderful job that man has. He reads a nonfiction book every week. He's got a great mind, and he just interviews authors and talks to them. And I said so, to myself, that's a job I'd like to have. Well, tonight, I have that job, so uh, I'm pleased to be able to uh, uh, talk to Stephen Talty, and I prepared a series of questions which uh, I'm going to pose to him. First of all, Stephen, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself personally, um, where you grew up, your education, family background, work experience, writings, publications, and books, and so on and so forth. Great. Um, first, John, thanks for having me, and thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I grew up in Buffalo. Um, we call it the Paris of the Northeast. <laughs> Not a lot of people agree with that. Um, I went to Embers College, and as soon as I came out of college, uh, I started writing. I went down to Miami Herald. I worked as a cop reporter. Um, and I came back, and I actually went to Ireland. My parents are originally from West Clare. And uh, I went back to discover my roots, so I did some writing over there. And I came back to New York and just started working in magazines. And about 12 years ago, I had my last office job in the magazine and started this series of books, um, Narrative History. And I was, I, John and I were talking at dinner, and I think what is sort of the common theme, I do a lot of historical figures, is the individual man up against sort of insurmountable odds. Um, I did a a book on Henry Morgan, the 17th century pirate who fought the Spanish Empire. I did one on the young Dalai Lama on his escape from Tibet and the communists in 1959. And this one, Asian Guard, was sort of another one in that series. I mean, he's a very ordinary man, as we'll talk about. Um, very undistinguished before the war, just could have been you or me, and ended up playing a part, I'm not going to say equivalent to Eisenhower or any of those, but essential and unique in its own way. So that's really what attracted me to him. Okay, now, um, you're married, you have uh, two young children, and your wife works. So uh, you like a, a stay-at-home dad and do your research at home? I am not a stay-at-home dad. I, I mean, I have a full-time job that's working, but I, I do work at home. And, uh, you know, it's it's a privilege to be able to do that. But uh, I'm able to sort of get everything, everything done and pick up the kids at 4 o'clock, so. Now, Stephen, you, uh, this is not your first book. This is, what, your fourth or fifth book? My fifth book, right. Fifth book. Um, just tell us generally what other subjects you've written about, other than uh, Morgan, which you've already mentioned. Right. Uh, I did a book on Napoleon's invasion of, of Russia, and my focus there was on uh, the role of typhus, the disease that attacked his army when he was in Moscow, um, really decimated his army and really tilted the, the balance of that war. Um, and I did the um, book on Tibet and the Dalai Lama that's called From Escape from the Land of Snows. And my first book was on the mixing of black and white culture throughout American history. It was on the music uh, and religion and sports, how the two races sort of came together and nourished each other um, instead of sort of being opposed to each other. All right, now the book we're going to talk about tonight has as its uh, backdrop the, um, the Spanish Civil War. And uh, in a few sentences, tell us a little bit about who the contestants were in the Spanish Civil War and, and what Pujo had to do um, with it and how, and how it impacted his life. Um, well, in many ways, the Spanish Civil War was kind of a preview of World War II. You had um, the fascist right um, supported by the military and headed by General Franco, and you had the communist left, um, which was very strong in Barcelona, where Pujol grew up. He was the son of a textile factory owner, a self-made man, someone who Pujol uh, really measured himself against. I think maybe one of the reasons that he went on this sort of crazy espionage career was that he was trying to live up to his father. But his father was a very um, loving, a very sort of liberal parent, and um, Garbo always felt that he was growing up in the shadow. So during the war, um, Garbo saw both sides up close. He didn't like either side, to be frank. He, was, um, he didn't want to sort of kill any of his fellow Spanish, Spanish uh, citizens in causes that he didn't believe in. And he saw each um, leader, 
he sided up close, and he, and he sort of was repelled by both of them. So he spent the war trying not to kill people, which is a very hard thing to do, believe it or not. Um, he, he crossed the lines from the Republican side, the, the leftist side, to the, to the nationalist side. And he um, basically, through talking, through using this instinct for deception that he had, was first exhibited in the Spanish Civil War, where he escaped killing anybody. Weren't there some famous Americans who came in uh, on the side of the Nationalists uh, uh, during the Civil War? Yeah, there was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, um, which was organized here in the Northeast. And um, there was, of course, Hemingway and uh, his ilk, uh, his friends of, uh, his newspaper friends, were very much on the uh, Republican side. All right, now, how did you initially get interest in Garbo and Pujo? It was really simple. I was reading a book about espionage in World War II. It's, it's a subject that I love. And I came across one sentence on this Agent Garbo and this incredible deception that he sort of did single-handedly. And I went to Amazon.com like anyone would, hoping to find a book. I thought there'd be three or four definitive books on this guy. And there was really nothing except a memoir that he, read, that he wrote right after the war. I bought the memoir and found it was full of really falsehoods. It was a spy's tale. He covered up a huge amount of things in there because he had to, because he had this instinct of a double agent. So I wanted to go back and tell the real story. Now, Pujol was obviously a very intelligent guy, but work-wise, I mean, he didn't have a great-looking resume. He, he ran a one-star hotel in, uh, in, in Madrid. He was a failed chicken farmer. And uh, how does a guy like this get to become a double agent, fooling uh, particularly the German people, and then getting the British to uh, accept his story that he wants to act, at, act as a double agent. Yeah, he was a classic loser. I mean, before the war, he'd done nothing of any sort of impact in his life. Um, but I think his instinct for what he eventually did started in, in boyhood. He had this incredible imagination that would sort of cause him physical injury. He would be so lost in his dreams that he would go crashing down banister, crashing downstairs went through a plate glass window. So he was sort of possessed by his own imagination, was the way he put it. And um, so and we can get into the mechanics of how he did this, but it was really the only skill that he had to offer. He wanted to defeat Nazism. He was not a Greek soldier, he knew that. He knew himself very well, but he knew he had this one great gift for making up stories and selling them to other people. And so that's what he decided to use. So my reading of the book, it seems to me there was a vast difference in the approach that the Germans took to uh, spying and how they recruited them and the kind of people they attracted and the way in which the uh, British approached the problem of spying. Is that so? I totally agree with that. Um, if you remember during the Cold War, we talked about the missile gap between the USA and the Soviet Union. I think during World War II, there was sort of... Uh, an eccentricity gap between the British and the Germans. The British respected eccentricity and imagination. They learned how to utilize it, especially in their espionage corps. The Germans uh, were much more conformist. They didn't trust people who didn't think like they did. And I think that really came down from Hitler. Hitler despised spies and espionage. Um, he really wanted, as he put it, to sort of win cleanly. He wanted to win on the battlefield with his uh, divisions with his panzer troops, and he didn't want to sort of trust people he felt were criminals to sort of go and, and trick the enemy. He felt it was sort of dishonorable. And that was actually something that was shared on the Allied side, but people like Churchill, who was a huge fan of espionage, saw how it could work, uh, especially in Africa, um, sort of carried the day and said, we have to use this resource that we have. So they went to the universities, they went to thriller writers. If you look at the people, the men who made up the espionage corps and the thinkers behind it, a lot of them were novelists. They were thriller writers, they were screenwriters, and they were eccentrics. Um, there's one great story of Churchill going to one of the uh, divisions where all these guys were working, and he said to the guy who was giving him a tour, I told you to, to turn over every stone to get these people, but I didn't think you'd take me literally. <laughs> and what he meant is, you know, where did you find these people under a rock? They were just like... It was like a loony bin, but they sort of had this one gift just like Garbo did, and the British used, learned to use it. Wasn't there one of the uh, 
the key of uh, British um, intellectuals or crackpots they used to go, and, and he would come in on a bicycle and he would, wearing a gas mask, and there wasn't any danger of any. <laughs> yeah, there was Alan Turing, maybe you've heard of him. He's, um, he was uh, a genius, uh, but he was extremely eccentric. He, when, the, when the war started, he buried all his gold in a field around his house, and after the war, he'd forgotten where he where he buried it. Um, so he had no skills in real life, but he, he was a huge um, contributor to breaking the, the Nazi codes. But the, the British um, were reluctant to accept uh, Peugeot. Uh, the Germans accepted him rather quickly in the beginning, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, if I can set the scene, um, Peugeot was living in Madrid, which was basically kind of a German colony. You had Franco, who was a, a fan of Hitler, a fascist himself. And so, um, Pujol was sort of looking around for a way to help the Allies. He felt that the Nazis were just deeply evil. He wanted to help the cause of freedom. And so he went to the British Embassy over a, a series of months, four different times, volunteering, volunteering his services. And the British response basically was, your services of what? I mean, what can you do for us? You're a, you manage a hotel. You, know, you have no skills. You have no training in espionage. What are you going to do? So he decided that he had to get something from the Germans and to go back to the British and say, okay, I'm a double agent, I'm trusted by the Germans, let me help you. So he marched into the German embassy and basically just started telling stories about the things he could do, the contacts he had, and he was making these things up on the spot. And if they had found him out, you know, this is something that goes really until he, he's transported to London, he's smuggled into London by the Allies, he would have ended up in a concentration camp. So this was really a life or death thing that he felt he needed to do. I was struck by what you said on page, um, I think it's 105. Um, from Harris's point of view, and he was one of the key uh, advisors on the British uh, uh, spy masters, one of the British key spy masters. Harris said the Germans were culturally and institutionally handicapped when it came to deception because they closed their mind to the irrational. Very interesting. It is. I mean, when you look at who made up the German spy corps, the Abwehr, they hired from people they trusted, people from military officers, military families, um, old aristocratic families. They wanted um, a certain breed of people, whereas the British went to people in the arts. You know, uh, you mentioned um, Thomas Harris, who was the MI5 handler, the sort of British Secret Service guy who handled Pujol. He was an art dealer and an artist himself, um, half Jewish. If you had taken Pujol or Harris and transplanted them, transplanted them to the German system, you know they would have been put up against a wall and shot just for being so different. And that's really what gave the British the edge. How, how did Pujol get the name Garbo? Um, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but once he sort of conned the Germans into sending him over to England, um, the British smuggled him in and they debriefed him because were, he was volunteering to be a double agent, someone who the Germans thought was, work, was working for them, who was really working for the British. But there is such a thing in espionage called the triple agent, somebody who pretends to be double and gets the secrets. Um, so they had to debrief him and ask him pertinent questions, you know, and try to really find out if this guy was who he said he was. And he put on a performance um, there in the, in the offices outside London with Tom, Tomas Harris and the other MI5 guys and they conferred afterward and they said, this is the best actor I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and who was the best actor in the world? It was Greta Garbo. So they said, let's call him Agent Garbo. Well, m many of the other uh, agents were giving, um, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, silly names or uh, disparaging, disparaging names, names, right. Uh, snakes and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah there's a, sort of a class division between the guys from MI5, a lot of them went to Oxford or Cambridge. And you know, the spies they had to work with were, a lot of them had been blackmailed. I mean, they were not sort of the salt of the earth. So um, they gave them a, names like Agent Weasel or Agent Cocaine. And just in that name, you could see the sort of disregard they had for him. But when they met Pujol, whose motives were pure, they, he didn't ask for money. He wasn't being blackmailed. He wasn't having an affair and you know, doing this against his will. He just risked his life for something he believed in. And so that respect is there in the name they gave him. The uh, first major involvement of American troops is in North Africa, November 8, 1942. 
And uh, Garbo uh, played a significant role in that. He was put in an extremely difficult position because uh, the Germans knew something was coming and he was going to warn them and he actually began to give the advice in writing something like seven to eight days before torch invasion of North Africa. And if he had disclosed it, it would have been a disaster. But he somehow arranged to make sure that the information arrived one day late. How did he pull that off? Um, you know, it was, it was something that was done with British Secret Services. Basically, there's a concept in espionage called the build-up, where you have a, a double agent who's working for you, and you want him to gain the trust of your enemy. So Garber was already fairly trusted, but they were building him up for D-Day, which was going to be the greatest deception in human history. So they had to give him, you know, authority and credence with the, with the Nazis. So when they planned to invade North Africa, what they did was start giving Garbo. Garbo had a network of 28 sub-agents, all imaginary, all came out of his mind. But they covered all parts of England and the Middle East. So he would tell them, you know, Agent 13 is seeing additional troops in Dorchester. These troops did not exist, of course. Um, and with that, he could sort of trace the movements of armies who were preparing to jump off either to North Africa or to Norway or over to France. So the key was essentially at that time he was reporting by letter. He didn't have a um, he didn't have a radio to, to to report in real time. So what they did was they gave him the actual plans, which were top secret, and they said we're going into Casablanca. And he said, so actually, Garbo had in his hands seven, eight, or nine days ahead of time right. the actual plans for the invasion of North Africa, and he was under instructions from his handlers in Berlin, get the information to us. Right. They felt the, the Germans suspected something was happening, and Garber was their main man in London. They, he was the most trusted spy they had. So um, he had the plans, and he basically just wrote out the actual war plan, what was going to happen, that Patton was going to come into Casablanca, the, the true you know, blueprints for the war. This was the fall of 1942. And so he, if he had done this by radio, he wouldn't have been able to do it. This was real time. He was calling Madrid. They were relaying that on to, to Berlin. That came later. So he wrote a letter, and MI5 took it. They stamped it for the day he sent it. MI5 was the British. The British Secret Service. They had a courier bring it over to Madrid. His handlers were in Madrid, connected to Berlin. And they placed it in his postal box one day after Patton went into Casablanca. So that day, his German handler went to the, to the box, opened it up, and read this letter where everything was confirmed as to what had happened with Patton in, in Casablanca. Here was the entire war plan. It just had arrived 24 hours too late. A quote, totally by design. And I didn't see anything in the book that gave me reason to think that they were suspicious of him. Matter of fact, they, they, they thought he did a marvelous job. The Germans thought he did a marvelous right. job. You know, that's sort of a complicated question. He, he really um, bamboozled the guys in Madrid. And the interesting thing about the, the spy chief in, in, in Madrid was that he was half Jewish. And then he knew that if he didn't get information, he was going to be sent to the, the front lines in the east and to, to Russia. So when Pujol arrived with all these connections and with these great stories, and after North Africa with access to British war plans, Pujol became his, you know, his ticket to life. I mean, he could have been sent to a concentration camp. So, he backed anything that Pujol said. He was sort of his mentor within the, the German spy service. So he's, Pujol knew that, and he played on it, and he sort of became the prima donna of the of the Abwehr. And um, he just knew how to play people, and he knew what their weaknesses were and how to exploit them. Uh, tell the audience what the Abwehr was. The Abwehr was the military counterintelligence for the Nazis, basically. And anything having to do with uh, foreign territories that they conquered, the Abwehr was getting information on England, France, etc. On, on page 105, uh, you make a statement um, that uh, it would seem that the Germans uh, were fooled by the British far more than the British were ever fooled by the Germans in the spy game. Is that so? That's absolutely so. Um, by the middle of the war, the Germans had no active agents within England. And that was partly Hitler's fault. Hitler felt that after he conquered France, 
wanted to have a peace treaty with England. Uh, he didn't want to invade them originally. So he told um, the spy service, keep your dirty spies out of England because I'm going to try to you know, sweet talk Churchill and have a, a, uh, an armistice. So when they decided in 1943 not to go into um, England in Operation Sea Lion, they canceled that operation. They had no one within England. And then you also had the cultural problem where they simply didn't trust their spies. They didn't train them well. They didn't support them because deep down, they thought they were sort of arch criminals and they were not honorable people. Uh, uh, Khrushchev did have one big failure. That was uh, Operation Cockade. What, what was that all about and what were the consequences to Khrushchev for that? Uh, right, Cockade is the, is the summer and fall of uh, 1943. It's essentially it existed for two reasons. It was a dress rehearsal for the D-Day invasion. They wanted to test their deception operation to see if they had the Germans in the bag. Essentially, if Pujol had them under his spell. And the other reason was political, because Stalin was pressing for a second front. He was fighting and losing thousands of men a day <coughs> in the east, on the Eastern Front. So he wanted an invasion of France, basically. So what they did is decided to keep the pressure off of Russia is to have a fake invasion of France in uh, 1943. And Pujol was given the job of sort of carrying that over to the Germans. And they also wanted to sort of get the Luftwaffe the planes up in the air and destroy them. Um, so he started sending messages. But what they learned, I mean, it was sort of a rehearsal for a great play. And they were working out the kinks. And what they learned was that this was like shooting a great epic Hollywood film. You had to have all the parts, all the script writers, all the actors in play. And they found out that it was hard to get cooperation from the different forces. The US Navy was supposed to send decoy boats. They hadn't even heard of the operation 10 days before it was about to start. The coordination just wasn't there. And the Germans just didn't believe it. It wasn't a believable story that they were going to invade in 1943. So it sort of became a question of, what if you staged an in, in, invasion and nobody came? The Germans didn't believe it. They didn't send any planes in the air. It was a colossal failure. and so. Pujol and the guys who planned it were walking around in 1943, a year before D-Day, thinking that D-Day is going to be a bloodbath. We just failed in our greatest rehearsal. Our dry run was a complete uh, abomination. And so they were probably the most depressed people in London in, you know, in the fall of 1943. Yeah, you know, uh, Stephen, we didn't talk about an interesting character. Um, and that, of course, would be um, Pujol's wife, Araceli. Uh, tell, she was a beautiful Spanish gal, smart, witty, and uh, had a lot of talent. And uh, what happened to their marriage when uh, they moved to London? Right, this whole spy project really began as a love story. It was um, Pujol and his wife, Araceli, who many people compared to Eva Gardner, a very beautiful woman. And they cooked up this scheme in Madrid uh, in 1939 together. Uh, it was their project. She went to some of the embassies to try to convince people. Um, and then they succeeded. They were sent to London and with her two small children. And Pujol sort of disappeared into MI5. He went to work every day. He couldn't tell her what was going on. She hated England. It was cold. So he couldn't tell anyone that her, her husband was a war hero because he was you know, a spy. He, you know, she couldn't speak English very well. So she was isolated and homesick. And the tension just grew. And finally, in 1943, she threatened to report Pujol to the Spanish and to blow his cover, essentially, to give him up. She was just trying to get home, basically, trying to blackmail the Allies into sending her home. What uh, reaction did the British have when they found out that Araceli was about to expose their key double agent? Well, they thought at first that they'd have to cancel Garbo, that they'd have to stop the mission. And then Garbo came up with an idea. He said, let's run a spy mission on my wife. Uh, deception operation. So they basically arrested him, put him into a, a cop car, threw him in jail. But it, it, was, it was an arrest just to give the impression that he was in trouble. It was completely fake. It was all. It all came out of um, Pujol's mind. He said, "I know how to fool my wife." And so they brought her in uh, in, in a blindfold to the prison and said, um, and met him. He was a prisoner with guards standing by, and they said. And Pujol said, you know, they heard about your threats, and um, I punched the, the leader of MI5 in the face, and now I'm going to be sent to trial tomorrow and possibly executed. 
and she nearly fainted away. Um, she just could not believe that her, her threats had resulted in this. And so she swore up and down she would never do it again. She would be a dutiful wife. And um, she went back to the house and never caused trouble again. But the sad thing was is that it, it was sort of the beginning of the end of their marriage because I think Pujol know, knew what he had done. He turned this great talent against the love of his life. And um, to protect you know, those American GIs and British servicemen that he was going to have to cover, um, but I never think they trusted to get each other again. Not necessarily in, in defense of what he did, but um, it seems to me from reading the book that he had an extraordinary uh, willpower to uh, accomplish his ends, uh, namely to defeat the Nazis that he hated, and he was willing to risk or even to sacrifice his marriage in order to accomplish that end. Is, is that true? I think that's true. Um, for him, defeating Nazis was his cause. It's the only cause he ever found in his life. Um, before the war, he was a failure. After the war, we can talk about, he resumed that pattern of failure and sort of aimlessness again. Um, he only had really one true talent. So in, in reading the book, you can sort of see it as a tragedy, the fact that this man had a talent that was only usable for four years or sort of, um, you know, a triumph in that he had this one gift and it met his moment in history. He was probably the only person who cared, could have carried this off, but he had no uses in ordinary life. And yeah, he decided that the cause was too great to sort of keep his marriage together. And um, we can talk about what happened after the war, but he sacrificed his marriage. Uh, eventually, what happened to the marriage? Um, after the war, they moved to South America, to Venezuela. Aricelli, you know, toughed it out for about three more years and then went back to Spain in 1948 and uh, took the children with her. And um, they had oh, three children. children did they have at that time? They had three small children. Uh, I met them all in Madrid when I went over to research the book. And um, he was dead to them for 30 years, to those children, um, because he had to cover his tracks and faked his own death. Well, he, he, he faked his death. How did, how did they pull that stunt off? He feared, you know, he was in Venezuela, which, don't ask me why he went there to, to get away from Nazis, because that's where the Nazis went as well. Um, and so he was afraid that people would uncover him. He always used his real name, even in Venezuela. And so he sent in a message to his handler, Tomas Harris, in MI5, and said, um, for the good of my family, I have to die. So create a story that I died of malaria in Angola, in Africa. And so he sent out this story to other MI5 people, and it was believed around the world. I mean, to those few people who knew who Pujol was, it was believed that he was dead, and that included his children. It was, it was a tragic sort of consequence. Do you, do you think Araceli believed the fake story of his death? I don't think she did. I think she knew Pujol pretty well by that time, and um, I think there was some contact after he was supposed to be dead um, about his pension and things like that, so I don't think she bought the story. <laughs> But uh, she, landed, she kind of landed on her feet, too. What happened to her? Um, she uh, eventually married an American guy named Chrysler. Um, he was, he'd been a, a double for Rudolph Valentino in Hollywood and then went to Spain, and he was connected with the um, American embassy. And some people thought he was CIA over there. But they started one of the great art galleries in Spain called the Chrysler Gallery. It's still there in Madrid if you want to go by. And his son runs it now. Uh, Juan Pujol's son runs it now. So they had... She, she, all her dreams came true with this American guy. She had social success, money, and you know a great uh, home in, in Madrid. Okay, now this dead man, uh, three marriages, right? Uh, has more children. And where do you live, and what happened to him? Um, after the war, he moved, as I said, to Venezuela. He tried to start a farm. The farm was a failure. Was he was sort of haunted by dictators throughout his life. Um, we had Franco in Spain. She took good, pretty good care of him, didn't they, yeah. financially? What did, what did they do for him? Well, you have to remember that um, Pujol supposedly had 28 agents in England, and, excuse me, the Nazis were paying him for those 28 agents. <laughs> so he had... He made, everyone was a fake. Everyone was a fake. It was just Pujol. And so he actually supported part of the, the British spy service with that income. But when the, the war was over, uh, the British gave him the rest of the money. It was about a million and a half dollars. He went to Venezuela, bought a farm, but he encountered another dictator after Franco and Hitler who confiscated the farm, and he basically went to work for Shell Oil as a translator, a very humble position. Uh, his wife opened the gift shop. He married a, a young Venezuelan girl, 
and um, had three kids. So he had, he had two families that didn't even know each other existed, one in Spain, one in Venezuela, and they didn't really reunite until 1984. So in 1984, uh, he's rediscovered and comes back to life. And in the meantime, he's got how many children by his second wife? Three children. And uh, we're not sure, are we, whether his children from his first wife knew about his fake death, but Araceli probably thought it was fake. The children definitely didn't know. I spoke with them, and um, his oldest son was named Juan Pujol, and I spoke to him in, in the art gallery, and he just started weeping about the rediscovery of his father in 1984. He'd been in the shower, he was listening to, to radio, and they said uh, a new Spanish war hero has been found, Juan Pujol. And he always been told that the man was dead for, you know, since 1948. So it was joyful and painful at the same time. It was a, a very sort of interesting reunion. How did, how did the uh, two families get along when they finally met sometime in 1984, 85, or 86? Well, I should sort of tell the story of how he reemerged. Um, a British spy writer found him, brought him to London for the 40th anniversary of uh, D-Day. And um, he became a huge hero. He's on the front page of you know, the Daily Mail, all the Spanish, uh, the English tabloids. And the news got to, uh, to Spain, of course. Um, Araceli went to bed for three days after she found out that he, he'd sort of reemerged. And um, they had a reunion in Barcelona. And Araceli gave her children very good advice. She said, you know, he's an old man now. He probably only has a few years left. You can either spend them in bitterness or you can spend them in happiness. And they chose not to question him about why he had left them alone and just to sort of spend those remaining years happily. And they did. The, the two families, the, the cousins go to each other's wedding, uh, they're you know, friends on Facebook, et cetera, they, they really get along very well. And um, I think that's really a testament to Eric Shelley and her advice. Now, uh, as I recall, J. A. Gover was very, very anxious uh, to meet uh, Bujo. Uh, did that, did that, uh, that encounter ever uh, happen? I'm sorry, who? Uh, J. A. Gover. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover flew Pujol over right after the war. Um, you have to understand that Pujol was sort of a trade secret. He was the spy spy. People on the outside didn't know him. He wasn't like 007. But in, this, in the sort of spy community, he was a legend. So yeah, uh, J. Edgar Hoover flew him over. They met in a bunker in, uh, under, uh, by uh, Hoover's home. And he just had dinner with him, basically. Just wanted to meet the guy. And uh, actually, Pujol was hoping for a job offer. He wanted to sort of continue to be a spy. Um, but it never came. How would you sum up Pujol's legacy in uh, history among the historians, um, both German and English uh, writers who have uh, written about this period of history? Um, I think maybe something we skip, skipped over a little bit was about Pujol and D-Day. We should talk about how um, D-Day was his sort of masterpiece. Um, they had groomed him to be the spy who was going to tell the Nazis about D-Day. And so they wanted, the, you know, the, of course, the invasion was coming in Normandy. They wanted the German fleet was coming in Calais. So um, what Pujol did was he basically positioned all his troops around, his uh, sub-agents around England in the ports that would be natural for a Calais invasion. And he said, you know, I'm seeing all these new tents, 40,000 tents in Dover. Um, I'm seeing American insignia, shoulder patches in this town. Slowly building a picture, almost like one of those pointillist painters who point one, paint one little dot at a time, letting the Germans put the picture together, but giving them all the information that they needed. And this was backed by sort of enormous theatrical production. They had um, fake airfields uh, that would be natural for a Calais invasion, and they built them and they would have airplanes land there. And they had fake camps where it looked like 40,000 men were stationed there, but it was a few hundred men lighting the campfires. They had fake destroyers. So they, Pujol was the point of the spear, but behind him was this entire Hollywood production. And on the day of um, the invasion, um, or I'm sorry, two days after the invasion, a lot of people think D-Day was one day, but essentially it was the first day in a long battle and invasion. So two days after the um, June 6th, um, Hitler had to make a decision whether to move all his panzer divisions down to Normandy to um, stop this invasion that he knew was on the ground. He knew that troops were coming ashore. Or to hold them for this potential invasion of Calais that people like Garbo, I mean, mainly Garbo, was telling them. 
was coming. Hold your troops there. So Jesse was about to make that decision. A cable arrived from Garbo saying, I have uh, proof that the invasion is coming at Calais. Normandy is just a fake. It's a feint. They want you to move down to Normandy so they can sweep through Calais, up to the Ruhr, and into Berlin. And in that moment, um, Hitler said, cancel the movement of the Panzer Divisions, hold them at Calais. And so that those days after um, the invasion were when the battle was in balance, had those Panzer Divisions moved down uh, into the hedgerows, into those small towns that came, it would have been a different battle and a different war. And that's really where um, Pujol made his mark in stopping the reinforcements coming down and attacking the American Jam GIs who had landed at, at Omaha. If I recall, Eisenhower said something to the effect that uh, if they can pull this off and keep the German panzers away from Normandy for three or four days, we're going to have a successful invasion. And that was the key thing for, right. for Pujol to be able to do, to convince the Germans that we really were faking when we were coming to Normandy. So hold back and uh, don't send don't send those panders from uh, from uh, Valley Clay down to Normandy. Right. Um, Eisenhower actually asked the spy chief for 48 hours. He said, just hold those guys in place for 48 hours. Uh, Pujol's deception really lasted months. Those those. Panzers never moved out of where they were for the most part. Um, they just believed this man implicitly, and so they kept this army there, waiting for a phantom army of one million guys that never really existed. It was all a product of uh, Joel's imagination. And so even when they interviewed um, people at Nuremberg after the war, the, the chiefs of the general, general staff, they said, you know, what was the key to your loss at Normandy? Why didn't you come down to stop those troops? And they said that cable of of Pujols, uh, three days after the invasion, um, was 99% of the reason. Um, we believed him. Uh, many of the people still believed him, you know, two or three years after the war. And so uh, they felt that he was deep, uh, a mole deep within the, the British High Command, and that he had sort of a direct link to Churchill. So he's, he, was, he was, you know, worth a few divisions at least. Uh, on page 19, you talk about uh, the interview uh, with Field Marshal William Keitel. Right. Um, and uh, he himself uh, was satisfied with the uh, with Garbo's report. Right. And had a great influence on keeping the uh, Panzer forces uh, at the Valley Clay. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, one sort of measure of how much the Germans valued him is that even towards the end of the war, he got a, a cable from Madrid, um, came over the radio, and they said, we want to award you the Iron Cross uh, for, for bravery in battle. And the Iron Cross at that time was strictly a battlefield uh, medal. And the Germans pulled strings so that this man would never see battle, but they believed had really saved the war as they thought, as they thought it at that time would get it. So they sent it through channels. He's, he, the family still has it in Madrid, and he was he was knighted by the British king, got the Iron Cross from the German uh, side. So it, it just shows how total his deception was. All right, we're, we're going to uh, throw the uh, throw it over for some questions. Uh, who's got the portable mic? Uh, please wait until the microphone gets to you before um, you start speaking and. Uh, Keep your questions short. Would you tell the story of the creation of the two carriers where one is leaving from the Indian Ocean? Right. That was um, what they call the signals deception. They had a uh, uh, carrier that was down in, uh, off the uh, African coast. They wanted the, the Germans to believe that it was moving up uh, northwards. And so basically he created Pujol, started sending cables to the Germans that he was getting, uh, he was getting uh, reports of a carrier, one moving down and one moving up. So basically they had a brand new carrier that was not even christened yet. They sent it down there um, and started seeing, sending fake signals up. 
So you had, basically, the Germans had a big board that they would keep all the armies on, all the ships on, all the destroyers on. And you had that, on Pujol's word, disappear off the coast of Africa and slowly be replaced by this other one. That, that carrier that was going, uh, that was off the coast of Africa was being sent as part of uh, another mission. So it disappeared off the sort of the German military map. And it was all done basically through signals, through radio traffic that Pujol created, sending out this false trail that, uh, that the carrier was on the move. Uh, we have a question in front. Just a quick question. Um, was there no one in the German, even at the beginning, that, that kind of doubted him? Uh, there's usually somebody that says, eh. Yeah, there were. Um, there were just like in any great organization, there were rivalries. There were people who believed that this man in Madrid had been hoodwinked. And um, there were two German spy organizations, the SD and the Abwehr. And they sort of were pushing their own agents. It's sort of like the Hollywood star system. They each wanted their guys to succeed. So um, that's really why, they, why the Allies had the buildup. They gave him true information. The, the information he sent at the beginning was 100% true. And slowly they transformed that until at the end, he was sending 100% false information. But you had to sort of establish that trust. So how they overwhelmed that, that initial distrust, that initial uh, suspicion of Pujol was by giving him great information that they could check out. So um, it happened, but the Allies anticipated it. In history, uh, my brother's youngest brother, Louis, the lake in St. Paul, France. I understand that was the Nazis' first big battle to stand on the uh, tide of movement in France. Is that correct, sir? Um, that really wasn't part of my research, that particular battle. But, um, uh, you know, I can, we can talk afterward and I can look that up for you. Thank you. Sure. Question in the back. Hi. First, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your research and your book with us. I thought it was a marvelous uh, interview. Credits to both. Thank you. Um, I can't. I, I have to mention that I'm also from Buffalo, so. Um, Very cool. <laughs> uh, you went to Bishop Timon? Bishop Timon, yeah. Timon. I was at Cal Sanchez. I don't know if it was oh, yeah. business when, of course. Uh, when you were there. How do you do your research? Are you able to read foreign languages? What, what's the, where's your launching point? For this one, um, I found out that his family was still living in Madrid, and what way I moved my family to Madrid for 10 months. Um, and basically, I felt that I had to get to know them so that they could trust me with their father's story and their grandfather's story. So the three kids still live in Madrid, and the granddaughter, Tamara, was sort of my contact with the family. She had all his private letters, Pujol, because after the reunion in 1984, um, they sent letters back and forth, and he began to tell his life story and his reasons, his motivations behind everything. So um, I don't read Spanish very well. I can, you know, I can order a beer in a, a bar in Madrid, and that's about it. Um, so she would translate on the spot for me, give me all the family pictures. So you know, really, without the family, I couldn't have written the book. And then for for the English side, I went to the Q archives, which are the National Archives outside of London. And um, you know, he was an MI five agent, so he's his every message he sent over is in those MI five files. Um, so between sort of the archives and the family, it was sort of, you know, a, a nonfiction writer's sort of dream assignment because I had both sides. Mm -hmm. Question in the back. If, um, if the information went all the way up to Canaris, was there ever the potential for Canaris, who later, you know, turned against the Nazis, to, uh, who I assume didn't realize Bujol was a double agent, for him to sort of do a double negative and turn around his information? Right, there was, you know, there's still a sort of conspiracy theory about Pujol, um, which a few writers believe in, and that is that people like Canaris, who opposed Hitler but were still within the German high command, used Pujol to send false information uh, to Hitler and his commanders. Basically, they, uh, they wanted Hitler to lose, and so they fed him. So they, they knew Pujol was a double agent, but they let him exist in order to destroy Hitler. Um, I don't really believe that theory. Um, it's out there, but um, I think that they um, sometimes exaggerated Pujol's information, um, but because Hitler always discounted um, intelligence. If, if, if you told him an army um, coming across the Atlantic from America had 100,000 troops, 
he would instantly cut that figure in half to 50. He just never believed the reports because he thought the German cause was invincible. So I believe the reason that um, some, some people in the German high command, some people in the Abwehr, and people like Canaris um, sometimes embellished Garbo's information is that they knew that once it reached Hitler, he was going to discount it. So they sort of had to build it up in order for it to reach the right level once Hitler received it. What was Pujol's ethnicity? Was he Catalan? Was he Spanish? Or was he <coughs> is that thing on? Um, I, I heard the question. He was asking about his ethnicity, uh, whether he was Catalan. He was Catalan. He was born and raised in Barcelona. Um, he was always a, a proud Spaniard, very proud of the Catalan heritage. Um, and he was a little controversial in Spain because at that time of the Spanish Civil War, Barcelona was a red city. It was very much a Republican city. And um, he started off on the Republican side and then switched to the Nationalist. Um, but my book is actually being published um, this year in Spain, and I'm hoping that they come to a better understanding of his motivations and that he was really a pacifist during the Spanish Civil War and did not want to kill you know, either Franco's people or the Republicans. That was really his, his main ambition in Spain, was to avoid killing his brothers. He had no converso? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Was he able to accomplish anything after D-Day? Um, after D-Day, they still had two very important missions for him. The first one was the V-2 bombs. They wanted to know where these, this sort of last gasp of Nazi technology was going to fall. And so um, the Germans wanted him to report which neighbors, neighborhoods he was hit, the, I'm sorry, the bombs were hitting so that they could aim the bombs better. And he basically sent back false reports and and help the V2s land outside the populated areas. And the second mission was, uh, once the war was over, um, British Secret Service was worried about a fourth Reich. They wanted to know if the Nazi survivors were gonna go underground. And so they actually spent, they sent uh, Pujol back into the belly of the beast, back to Madrid. He met his Nazi handlers and determined that there was no plans for, you know, uh, reviving the Nazi dream. So they actually you know, risked his life so that they, he could go on one last mission and, and report on the, the Nazi aftermath. Okay, maybe two more questions, and I think that will be uh, the close. And I see one down here in the front. Wait, wait, wait. You got one in the back over there? Go ahead. Uh, uh, with the success uh, of Garbo and also Montague with The Man Who Never Was and mm -hmm. Eddie Chapman, etc. Should history re-look really at the confidence of the German intelligence group? I think they should. I think especially before the war, the Germans uh, were supposed to have the best secret service agency in the world. Um, and I think the war proves that they did not. They, but I think it was not an institutional problem. I think the Abwehr did what they did very well, especially technical intelligence. But uh, the problem was once it went to the high command, um, they didn't believe the intelligence. They didn't trust it enough to sort of act on it. So I think it was really a problem with the whole uh, German hierarchy, especially the German high command, and how they used the intelligence. Um, definitely they were overrated, and the British and the Americans were much more effective. All right, last question up here in the front. Thank you. Uh, was some of the uh, German acceptance of of his story about D-Day related to their disbelief that Patton wasn't involved in the in the in the first phase of, of uh, D-Day. I think so. I think um, um, when Pujol created this imaginary one million man army that was going to come across at Calais and devastate the German defenses, Patton was named as the commander. Um, so he was sort of held out of Normandy in order to give um, stature and credence to Pujol's imaginary army. And so uh, the Germans always rated Patton as the best battlefield commander. And I think it was a brilliant stroke on the part of the Allied intelligence to put them at, at the head of that army, because the Germans never believed that they would waste such a guy you know, in, in, in a deception. Um, so that also goes back to the German sort of contempt for deception and espionage, the fact that they never believed it. And it was very, you know, it was a very effective tool. Okay, this is the last question. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, fascinating story. Appreciate it very much. Uh, has anybody ever approached you as far as making a movie? Uh, no, the rights are available. <laughs> uh, no, we've got some interest, but it has been optional. All right. Uh, before we close, I just want to make one uh, final uh, announcement. Uh, Stephen is moving from New York to Montclair, New Jersey. He'll be our neighbor and uh, a member of the World War II Book Club from now on, I hope. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.